Holy crap. That is really impressive. I'm really happy with the construction here. This video card has five fans. It's got three on the front and two up top, and it's called the Mega Gamer. No word yet of a roadmap for the future Giga Gamer or Terra Gamer, and we weren't able to find any evidence of a prior Killa Gamer, but it's definitely a missed marketing opportunity. This card is made by Maxun, possibly one of the most forgotten motherboard manufacturers, and mostly for good reason, and they're making a whole series of Mega Gamer cards. We bought the RTX 4080, since it was the highest end GPU they're selling in a five fan assembly. The reason we bought the 4080 one is pretty simple because we needed to generate as much heat as was possible with this design to properly test it and see if the fans, when all the testing is controlled fully, actually make a difference. Despite being obvious meme material with the name and let's be honest, the two fans on the top and the thumbnail potential here, uh, it is in fact fairly solidly built where not only does it have some heft, but it's not pointless heft. It's not like they stuffed it with lead weights to make it feel higher quality. There are some areas where the quality is genuinely pretty high. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and their new series 500TG ARGB mid tower case. The Thermaltake series case is perforated all on the front panel and the power supply shroud, including perforations on the cable side of the case for further ventilation to the PSU and hard drive chamber of the case. A separate access door for hard drives makes the case easy to work with for three and a half inch storage, or the door can be swapped out for a separate LCD panel kit that displays system information. Other features include a GPU support kit, vertical mounting, and a hinged glass panel. Learn more at the link in the description below. This thing we paid $1,400 for, that included the shipping from China. The baseline MSRP for a 4080 is $1,200, and that's there are some cards out there for $1,200. So this is $200 price we paid over other 4080s on the market, which means it needs to be phenomenal in order to be worth that, or at least really unique. Like the Yestin Sakura card, for example, maybe you could justify the extra expense just on the looks alone. This one, although it is unique, it doesn't necessarily look different enough to justify a $200 price bump. So the fans are going to be the number one focus today, specifically whether they do anything. And for that testing, we need a lot of controls in place because if you just unplug them, or if you disassemble and then unplug them, you're introducing all kinds of variables. For example, the variable fan RPM, the fan per percent speed might change from disconnecting those top fans. And additionally, if you disassemble first and reassemble, it creates a whole new set of problems with pressure uh, being potentially not the same and with thermal paste spread. But we have all of that under control. We'll talk about it in a little bit. So here's the card closer up. The two fans that we've been talking about, it's those two right there. So we've got that sticker there. We can use either a simple laser tack like this one, or we have a much more advanced tack as well. And uh, either solution will give us the fan RPM when pointed at the sticker. Basically, the air from the front, before it hits the fin stack at this very top edge, is able to hit this fan. If this fan is overpowering it, which is typically unlikely, let's be real, it's pushing against something much more powerful on the front, then it's going to pull the air up immediately. They would be able to get maybe a little bit more efficiency with a dam in there to block the airflow and uh, force it straight through, especially because this particular side is flow through anyway. So that's why the fan, it's okay. <laughs> that's why the fan on this side doesn't really do anything because the air is just going straight through. It'll pull a little bit of heat off maybe, but you'd really have to custom tune the VBIOS to, to be useful here. The flow through area has this plate somewhat blocking some of that flow through. The impact here may not be that large. There's bigger bigger fish to fry for uh, the Mega Gamer card here than this particular issue, but obviously that's suboptimal. It's just whether or not that matters is kind of a different story. The air can also escape through the bottom, so the fins are top to bottom, which means uh, that all the air is going to you know, come out top to bottom as well, and that also allows the top fans to have their best chance of doing anything whatsoever. It's got some venting on it. This venting doesn't do anything really. Uh, Maybe some passive movement of air outside of the card when the fans aren't really spinning, but there's no pinholes through the fin stack here. So it's just a solid metal wall inside of there. So it doesn't really do much. This card oddly is lacking dual V BIOS. So the PCB is, is underneath this lip, this uh, aluminum shroud lip. But even so, looking into the card, 
there is no VBIOS switch inside of there along the top edge of the PCB, uh, which I mean, there's just no dual VBIOS. For a card this expensive, we would kind of expect that, especially with this many fans. And there's no dual VBIOS switch on the back of the card either, although it looks like they were maybe considering it because that is just about exactly the size of a physical toggle button dual VBIOS that you would see on other cards. And then finally for the walk around, the back plate is actually functional. So this is awesome. In testing, we noticed this is actually conducting a lot of heat. It gets hot to the touch, which is good. That's what it should do. And it's much better than a lot of companies that don't attach the back plate to anything. And so it just sits there insulating the card. So really cool to see that from Maxon. That's an effective design. It helps with cooling. So that covers the walk around for now. And at this point, what we really need to do is just look at how it performs. So let's go to the thermal charts. Our first thermal test is really simple, so we'll keep it short. This is just an overtime chart of the thermals under a complete out-of-the-box configuration. No modification of the fans whatsoever, at least not yet. For baseline, it runs around 63 to 67 degrees Celsius on the GPU core, about 74 to 78 on the hotspot, and about 74 degrees Celsius for the memory. That doesn't actually tell us anything though without more controls in place. So let's prep the card for some A-B testing with the top fans deactivated. To keep the data as comparable as possible, now we need to disconnect these top fans, which I can do externally without influencing the assembly of the card. So we don't have to take it apart, mess with the pressure, the thermal paste. We can just pop these two cables apart, which they're not the easiest to get to, but when we do, it deactivates these fans without influencing anything else. Here's the chart with everything at steady state equilibrium with controlled fan speeds completely. This is a pure AB comparison that didn't involve any disassembly of the card itself. So we were fortunate in being able to externally access those fan cables to 100% isolate the test from any other variables. The result shows functionally no difference. <laughs> it's kind of a sad result, but at least it's not worse. The run-to-run -run variance on this particular test is approximately 0.75 degrees Celsius in our controlled environment, which means that the results are within error of each other. Technically, deactivating the top fans resulted in lower temperatures, but because that's within variation, and realistically we're talking less than one degree for some of these, the actual outcome is that they're the same. The fans don't do anything except generate additional noise, at least in our testing. Comparatively then, the Founders Edition card has been added to these charts to give some baseline. For this one, in a completely like-for-like -like scenario, it held 61 degrees for average GPU temperature, which is outside of any error whatsoever as compared to the Mega Gamer. So it's three to four degrees cooler than the more expensive Mega Gamer card. The hotspot temperature is also about three degrees cooler. And all of this is at about the same noise level. So it's about 38 to 39 dBA for the FE card as well. And that's the same as where the Maxon card is sitting when they're both left to their own devices with auto settings for whatever the VBIOS fan curve wants to do to hit the temperature target. So in other words, this is the fairest test possible and that it is the most like for like and we didn't even have to control the fan speeds to hit some noise normalized number, they are already noise normalized because they have the same target. And the Mega Gamer is worse. Even still, there's about 30 degrees of headroom on the memory for the Mega Gamer card, so that's in a good spot. And then the delta from the hotspot to the GPU core average is only 10 degrees Celsius, and that's about what we would expect for a reasonably designed card. You can't get much lower than that. It only triggers alarm bells when they're at, say, 20 degrees plus, and you see that more on something like an XTX rather than on these cards. So at least that much, objectively, is fine. It's just that the FE card is, is as we said, doing better. So with the thermals done, that brings us to the noise testing room. Thermally, the reason those fans aren't really doing anything is because it's, it's kind of like you're trying to help the ocean by pulling it towards the shore. And that's what these are doing. They're trying to help these much larger fans by pulling the heat and the air towards them when there's a much stronger force that will overcome them anyway. In the noise booth though, so this is what the booth looks like. This is our solution that allows us to get down to a 26 dBA noise floor, which is actually really good. And for this testing, the number one point versus the last charts is that deactivating the fans showed us a 0.8 dBA reduction. 
than having those fans on while having about the same performance, up to 1.5 dBA reduction, depending on where it is in the fan curve. So that was the main disadvantage of having the fans on. Now we're gonna look at the noise levels over time. So we'll use the auto curve that is included with just vBIOS, and we'll do a more manually controlled one. Automatic testing saw a fairly steady noise ramp over a 300 second period to 37 dBA at 20 inches, and with a noise floor of 26 dBA. The noise levels for auto leveled out at about 37 to 37 and a half dBA. After this period, we started interfering with it manually. The dip you see at about 650 seconds is when we manually stopped the two fans using a top secret testing method that we call the ouch method, wherein we shove a finger into the fans and then say, ouch, but only as internal monologue because it would otherwise influence the noise results. You can see an immediate drop in the noise level as a result. Those fans are worth anywhere from 0.8 to 1.5 dBA on the total noise profile, depending on the speed. Immediately after this, our next test was to do the opposite. We allowed the fans to spin freely again at the top, but we stopped all three large fans. The small fans went berserk and spiked to 7,100 RPM. They were trying to compensate here. The noise level peaked at 48 dBA under these insane conditions, and when we allowed the large fans to resume, they also initially ran at their own max speed of about 3,000 RPM because all the fans were freaking out trying to normalize for the thermals. Combined with the 7,100 RPM on the small fans, these two numbers allowed the card to briefly hit a little over 60 dBA until the GPU restabilized thermally and it followed the normal curve. Next, we ran some manual noise tests. Interestingly, we weren't able to use Afterburner to spin the small fans to their 7100 RPM speed because it only allows us to control the large fans. It doesn't detect the smaller ones. And spinning the large fans faster meant the small fans automatically would spin slower. The typical noise level at the thermal target with vBIOS is about 38 dBA. We hit about 57 dBA with the large fans at 2930 RPM, but were unable to force the small fans faster than 2200 RPM without stopping the large fans altogether. The last component left is the frequency test. If the Mega Gamer runs a higher clock than the Founders Edition card, that'd be its only good defense to run warmer than the FE card with this cooling setup but the clocks would have to be way higher. In this chart, the Mega Gamer plotted about 2835 megahertz for the clock for the entirety of the test. It never dipped once, which is because it's bound by voltage reliability rather than power. It's not bad to be bound by VREL. You have to be bound by something when you're a GPU and NVIDIA is building the drivers and the limitations, but VREL is a pretty common one for a card with boosted power limits. The 4080 Founders Edition card ran at 2775 megahertz, which means that the Max Sun Mega Gamer has a 60 megahertz advantage. It's not much, but it explains some of the temperature hike. It's not enough to justify the cooler design though, because Max Sun's design, although mechanically and physically it's sound and interesting in many ways, it's not an optimal performer. It is thermally inefficient. Okay, this teardown is going to be really quick and focused. So first, we're going to take the backplate off. There is a void if removed warranty sticker here. We don't like seeing those. Uh, it's not enforceable in the U.S., but if you're buying it overseas, then good luck getting help anyway. So for these, I'm going to track them on the mod mat. You can buy one of our large mod mats. That's the underlying service here on store.gamersnexus.net with screw tracking grids and anti-static properties. Or you can get the solder mat and project mat, which is the blue one I'm on top of here, also on the store. That's brand new. No more void sticker. All right, first question is if the back plate just comes off now. So you can see it's starting to separate. I know, the back plate's just really on there. Holy crap. That is really impressive. Okay. I, li I like seeing that. That explains why this is conducting so well. Uh, I'm going to try and salvage all this. Okay, here comes the unveil. So there it is. Let's, get, let's give a closer look. This is super cool, actually. I have never seen a backplate so well leveraged. This, this explains a lot. So my opinion of this card just went up significantly. It doesn't change how it performed thermally or acoustically. None of that changes, but what changes is I 
guess sort of just the overall trust in Maxon's ability to engineer a real solution beyond just sort of the memeing of the five fans and the mega gamer name. Because this actually, it does help. We've done testing. It's in years old videos at this point. I think the MSI Evoke might have been one of them. Some XFX thick or something was the other. But we've done testing with and without pads on a metal backplate. And it's more on the underlying components, which for this particular review, we didn't look at the MOSFET thermals or the individual memory module thermals. But that's where this stuff helps. It's not necessarily GPU core. You can see they've got a thermal pad, though, for the GPU core backside. Uh, but typically, you see the change elsewhere. And it's anywhere to the tune of 2 to 5 degrees, kind of on average. The most we ever saw from a backplate was actually 10 degrees on the memory components. And in that case, it was because without the pads, we added them ourselves. Without the pads, it was insulating all the heat, just trapping it back here and heating up all the components in a big way. But that was a different card. So you can see they use more of the clay type thermal pad here, and they covered basically everything. Quick perspective, this is the back of some of the VRMs. So that's going to be the back of the inductors, the MOSFETs. The MOSFETs are the ones that matter here. It's a lot of heat, even though it's on the opposite side of the PCB and you've got all these PCB layers to pull through, it can still pull heat through and that's effective. Uh, this is also going to be on the back of the other half of the VRM. We'll look at that closer in a moment. There's all these pads. Uh, so specifically these spots right here, here, and here, that's going to be the back side of where the memory is mounted. But memory is flip chip BGA, flip chip bulgur array. That means it's close to the PCB surface, which means depending on the thickness of the PCB, the silicon may actually be closer to this side than the top of the module uh, package. So this is really awesome to see. They went all out. Now, to be fair, this isn't $200 of thermal pads, but uh, it shows a certain level of care where a lot of big brand manufacturers we work with, they just cut corners and try and save a couple pennies. I think the card is about to come apart, actually. Nope. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Oh, man. You can hear the creaking from all the, uh, the thermal pads under there. They went a little crazy, but in a... Wow, okay. All the fans are here, so there's three connectors up here. I'm going to have to disconnect those before we make any progress. All right, there's... So this thing is massive, really impressive, the level of detail that went into this. I wish it performed a little better. I think where they're going wrong is just the efficiency of it all, where uh, there's some extra noise that's being generated primarily by these fans and by their presence. Without those fans there, they might be able to help contain it a little more, direct the air in a more sensible way, and get rid of the, the whine of those small fans. Because noise normalized, if you get rid of these fans, it should start to compete, or once you factor in frequency, supersede the performance of the 4080FE. Unfortunately, uh, the, the whole gimmick of this card is what's kind of hurting its competitive ranking. Regardless, though, the engineering here is really good. Let's take a look. So. This plate this is actually probably responsible for some of their efficiency losses as well. This plate is uh, connecting to the memory. So you can see this is where the memory modules were contacting. They've got a separate strip of thermal pad here to try and contact the last inner edge of memory. So uh, didn't work out quite maybe the way they wanted with the keep out zones, but they still covered it, which is better than we've seen elsewhere. There's even this gasket that's going around the GPU, which I have never seen before. I've taken apart at this point hundreds of video cards over the last, uh, over a decade at this point, and I've never seen, at least on a modern card, a company include like a gasket. So that's curious to me. I'm trying to think of why they might want to do that. Uh, thermal paste or, thermal, or liquid metal, rather, containment would make sense, but you would have to do that closer to the core. So that's how they're kind of framing it there. Uh, now for the rest of the cooler, a lot of plates, huge amount of thermal pads. They went insane. Actually, you know what? That's going to be some of it too, now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, so this is, this is unique. We've talked about this in the past where 
you start syncing more things to the same heat sink, it will have the effect of making the GPU core appear hotter when in fact everything else is just cooler, but the core is now sharing a heat sink with all these other components uh, and it's more than you would typically see synced. For example, with the, uh, let's say the FE card. And so because of that sharing, that reduction of thermals everywhere else on the board, it is going to negatively uh, make, it'll make the GPU appear thermally worse but it's still more than acceptable. There's a large base plates for contact, awesome overall work in machining. And same on this side, we've got all these different depths where there's like this half height section to contact, a huge line of filtering capacitors at the rear side of the VRM here. Then there's another thermal pad that corresponds to the inductors here. There's another large thermal pad that corresponds to the MOSFETs, really good contact on all of them. They all make an impression. This one contacting yet more capacitors. On this side, uh, we have the same situation. It's tons of thermal pad and direct contact. So I'm really happy with the construction here. They're sinking everything into plates upon plates. And underneath all of that is where the actual GPU is contacting, which is this plate here. And they ended up using a vapor chamber for that, which is, let me just double check that I'm right. Yes, that is a much more expensive way to do things. Uh, it's not unheard of, it's very common at this point. But the fact that they've still got all this other stuff going around next to its vapor chamber with heat pipe, that's what drives some of the cost up. So it's very evident where they spent their money. That doesn't mean that it's worth it for you to spend your money in the same place with them. Um, but I like that it's not just markup for sake of markup. There's a real reason. All right, we are separating the shroud and the cooler so we can get a better look here. So that's the cooler proper. There's seven heat pipes in there. I'm also now becoming aware of maybe more of some of that uh, thermal performance we were seeing where it was curiously a little lower than it deserves. And it's also going to be because of the fin density. So the fins are not as densely packed as you'll see on some other coolers on the market once you get internal here. The outer fins uh, aren't too bad, but internally they've got this additional spacing and some sort of like mid or quarter height fins mixed in there. That may explain some of it where it's a lot of metal. It's good quality contact patch. Still super impressed here. So cabling is routed well. They've got each fan. So this is a this is one fan. This is a fan cable. They have individual cables. And then these two small fans on the top here, those have the cables we disconnected during testing earlier that then go to uh, obviously another cable that just bridges in with the rest. Overall, very impressive. Um, I, I wish the performance were a little stronger, but hey, they're boosting 60 megahertz at least and there's a clear path to improvement on the next revision by getting rid of those small fans. So the shroud, it's just a thick piece of metal, uh, but it is actually doing stuff. It gets hot during testing, which again is what you want. And this is also clearly where a lot of money is going. I mean, this is all metal components in here. That's not cheap to do. Then the LED, so it connects to these two. You can actually see how uh, there's polarity here. So you got the green and blue and then red and black wires running. And that's why this thing can, it can only mount one way. So you, you can't do it the other way because uh, that's how magnets work. So uh, pretty good implementation there. And finally the board. This is crazy densely populated. Uh, let me try and read a MOSFET here. MOSFETs are labeled 2326, top of my head. I don't recall any of the specs for that one. Uh, but for the rest of it, so very dense VRM. The there's memory VRM components scattered around here. You can see some of these outlier ones. Uh, the fans all connect in this area. We've got an LED hookup. Interestingly, they're using two milliohm resistors up here, so not five milliohm. That's a five right there, though. That's more standard NVIDIA component choice. I think this would be a really good LN2 candidate if we get back to it and, and if this thing can get an unlocked V BIOS. But very impressive build quality. So let's move on to the conclusion. So the assembly, the uh, collection of parts as a product are at least a high perceived value and a pretty high build quality on things like the internal heat, heat sink structure as well. The external components, the fact that they used as much metal as they did, which definitely explains some of the price hikes. It's not like it's unjustified. It's just 
not palatable. One note here, the cost is justified in the sense that it's clear where it's going. They built a hell of a heat sink, really good contact everywhere, fairly impressive from an engineering standpoint and great use of the backplate and the PCB uh, has a mega <laughs> appropriate for the name VRM on it. Doesn't mean necessarily that it's worth 200 extra dollars for the average user, uh, especially if you're not overclocking, but we can appreciate where they spent the money at least. And it is a, a quality design. It just didn't perform competitively enough. Feature aside, we did like the nameplate. It definitely falls into that's not necessary territory because clearly you could just not have this be magnetic and have it be part of the mold. But there are some potential advantages here. They could do custom plates if they wanted to. It's easier for an end user to pull this off, pop off uh, the, the whatever it is, acrylic or whatever that is on top, the plastic, and then put something underneath it. And maybe there's some manufacturing benefits like being able to swap the names. So not 100% necessary, but a cool feature and a really slick execution of it regardless. Oh, one thing though, uh, it does make it a little bit unsafe to pick up if you don't know it's there. So if we were doing this earlier, so if someone comes by and doesn't know it's on there, they try to pick it up like this, it's possible it slips. So you do have to be a little bit careful of that. That's the only downside to that construction though. The fans are a gimmick. It's as simple as that. Those top two fans, uh, in our testing, they do nothing. And you could maybe architect a scenario where they do something, but it would involve making the front fans basically do nothing instead. So given those options, you're better off with the larger, quieter, better frequency profile front fans spinning as fast as you can tolerate them uh, than ramping these top fans in a way that would allow them to overcome the pressure and the natural flow of the front fans pushing air in and it just leaving on its own anyway. Plus those top fans were adding 0 0.8 to 1.5 dBA of noise to the noise profile, which is not worth it at all. Uh, and it's a worse noise profile as a result. A little bit higher frequency at that 2000 to 2700 RPM mark, much higher frequency if it gets above that, although the auto V bias doesn't seem to ramp that way. The most positive aspect of this review is that it shows that Maxon is capable of building a quality video card cooler. Did it again. Uh, even if this one is mostly gimmickry. So despite the top fans, the cooler is such that if another Maxon card comes out that looks kind of legitimate or real in that it's not purely a meme, we'd be happy to look at it because this is better at least overall build quality than we were expecting. And uh, that pretty much wraps it up. So it's a fun one to work on, not worth buying, just as simply as possible, but interesting nonetheless. And thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersexus.net to grab one of our mod mats or solder mats or one of our shirts, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to support us directly with small amounts of money and get some bonus content behind the scenes. We'll see you all next time.